The grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a great scene, huh? Gets me right here every single time. And if you haven't seen the movie Coco, well, I seriously recommend you set some time aside because it is beautiful. And I promise I'm not going to give any major spoilers right now. But one of the things that I absolutely love about this movie is that even though it seems to be all about the past with finding historical truth at its core, it doesn't stop there. <clears throat> Remembering the past and honoring the past and knowing the truth of it, they're critical elements of the story, but none of these elements would have any meaning without the little boy with the guitar, Miguel. It's this boy's connection to a long string of ancestral stories that makes all the difference in his life and in the lives of those to come. It's not to create a museum to what was, but instead to allow the past to live and grow into something fresh and beautiful for the future. So if this happens in genetic families, how much more so in a family of faith? The intention of mentorship, the need to pass on the torch, is built into a life following Jesus Christ. Without that forward focus, our faith lives and our faith communities can become kind of stagnant. And they can become museums dedicated not to who's next. But when a faith community and all the individuals within it see themselves as a bridge between the past and the future, no matter what their age, no matter what their development and discipleship, that community can become a vibrant place where fresh faith is growing all the time and where each one of us is continually leading others closer to Jesus Christ. So in this reading today, we find that Paul sees himself as that kind of bridge. And he's super bold about it. Imitate me, he says, even as I imitate Christ. Show of hands. How many of you would be 100% comfortable saying to the person next to you about your faith life, hey, imitate me? I'll let it. <laughs> You'll notice my hand's not up either. <laughs> Probably one of the reasons that you and I are here this morning is because we know that we haven't landed. No matter where we are, in our growth, how long we've been crafting a life of discipleship, well, we're here because we know there's a next step. I have a really hard time believing that Paul could have been any different. Even so, for him and for us, the essence of mentorship and faith is this boldness to say, hey, I know where you are, I've been there. So right now, watch me, and I'll keep my eye on Jesus until you can see him better than I can. I admit, that can be scary. In this chain, everything falls apart if either link starts to be fake. In either place, there's not much learning that can take place. Or if either the learner or the mentor pretend that a life of deep discipleship means that, well, you're happy all the time, or you never, ever act out of any kind of selfishness or pettiness, or lose your temper, or have a rough mental health day, or season. <laughs> oh, was that confessional? <laughs> we have to let go of the idea that we have to be some kind of perfect in order to be of use to another person growing as a disciple. For me, it gets a lot easier to say, well, here's the way to walk in faith, do what I do, when I know that one of the things I'm doing is being here every Sunday confessing, I am sorry, God, for the way I've hurt you and hurt others. And how freeing is it to someone you're mentoring to be able to say, you're going to screw up, just like I do. And God, who is faithful and just, will forgive both of us. In this part of the letter, 
and the sections before it, Paul tells the Corinthians what the essentials are to being a link in this faith chain. For Paul, it boils down to seeking not what would give him advantage, but what would bring good to many. Some other important pieces of advice from Paul come right before what we heard read today. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. The earth and its fullness are the Lord's. And the kicker, let no one seek their own good, but the good of the other. To me, this last phrase is the how. It's the answer to how we accomplish Paul's statement, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. Living life is good. Enjoying all the gifts that God has given us to the fullest is good. But the way that we live life and then glorify God in all the real life things that we do is to seek the good of others as we do them. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, that's how we make life's decisions, whether big ones, important ones, or seemingly inconsequential ones. And if we're doing that, we can be bold to say that that's something worth imitating. I haven't given a seminary report from up here in a while, but it's kicking along. I finished spring semester this past week, and one of my classes was an in-depth look at a few of Paul's letters. And one of the important ideas of the course was that at the time that Paul was writing, letters were considered a substitute for the person actually being there. A letter provided the presence of the person who had written it. And I think that's another reason that Paul could say to the faith community at Corinth, imitate me. Part of imitation is implied presence. To say the obvious, we can't be imitated if we're not there. Mentorship is not simply telling someone else what to do. You know, you should really go to church. That's not ever going to get someone to visit, is it? But, hey, I found something really special at Christ Lutheran, and I would love to share it with you. Would you like to come with me sometimes? And hey, I could even bring you out to brunch afterward. Well, it's real. It has some meaning, and it's eating and drinking and glorifying God for the good of another, and that's all beautiful, isn't it? Presence, seeking the good of others. The point is, we do not grow in faith alone. All of us are looking to others to help point the way toward Christ. Have you ever seen our youth director, Noel Thompson, interact with a person who's dealing with extreme poverty or homelessness? I have. And he is incredibly deft in making that person feel like a valued human being. And then he takes our kids on servant trips and the kids imitate that respect and kindness without even thinking about it. It's modeled. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. This past week, I had the privilege of participating in a wedding shower for a young couple in my small group whose genetic families aren't present for them at this important time in their lives. Well, a few days before, at a Women of the ELCA Bible study, several of the women told one of them, hey, we'll be your grandmas. And they were. They were there. They didn't need to be. What advantage to them to buy a short notice gift and then go spend a couple of hours in the youth house with this young couple that they barely knew. But they weren't seeking their own advantage. They weren't seeking the good for themselves. They were seeking the good for others. And it was a holy moment. The eating and drinking that took place definitely glorified God. Their actions shouted from the rooftops. This is how we 
do faith. This is how we do community. And maybe later, when you have a chance to be someone else's grandma, will you do this in remembrance of me? In a few moments, the focus of this worship time, it's going to change from words to action. Together, we're going to actively practice imitating Christ. We will speak his words, we will pray the prayer he spoke, and we will do that in remembrance of him. We will be caught up in an endless chain of discipleship, as communion gives us not only Christ, but all who are here, and all who came before, and all who come next. The incarnation, the presence of Christ in the eating and drinking that we are about to glorify God with, is inseparable from community. Through communion, we are reminded of the presence of Christ in all of us. And over and over again, we're reminded someone died for me. Maybe that encounter is where we truly learn to imitate Christ in the way that really matters. In dying with him, we're free to live for others. Those coming next are given a voice. They call out to us, and their needs become our responsibility. So I ask you, as you take communion today, Take a real look at your family of faith as they go by. Consider who your mentors are and who you are mentoring in faith. Think outside of these walls about the many that you are asked to seek the good of. Experience the moment. Be present. And let it create in you a closer imitation of Jesus Christ. And then, may everything you do glorify God as you point the way to Jesus for those who are next. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please rise and share that peace with one another and tell them your name when you do.